want to welcome all of our guests that are tuning in, and I know we're watching uh, virtual, it's just for a little while more, uh, but I just want to take a moment to just thank Pastor KJ and, and Greg and all of the worship team, as well as the production team, because this is, this is not entertainment. Um, our culture, we entertain ourselves into oblivion. Uh, um, singing songs to God is spiritual formation, it is, it is doctrine, it is theology, and it's great that our worship team is incredibly gifted, uh, but what they're doing is they are driving us, and like Pastor KJ said, our value here, our number one value here is a high and lofty view of God. What does that mean? Does it mean that, you know, that God is like, hey, I need you to worship me because I lack something? No, God is, God is, is, is life. He lacks nothing. He is all sufficient. He created us in such a way that in order for us to live, it requires worship. And I don't mean living, just breathing air. I'm talking about intimacy with God. Into me, you see, I'm talking about God's power, God's strength, God's mind, God's purpose is we worship. Worship is reminding ourselves of who God is and what he wants to do in us and through us. And for those of you new to Transformation Church or exploring the faith, when I use the word God, I don't mean generic. I mean the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the God of the Scriptures revealed in the person of Jesus. I want to say what's up to the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facilities throughout the state of South Carolina. Love you guys to our first time guests that are tuning in. Thank you for tuning in to the TC family. I have some awesome news. I love you. I want to applaud you that through 2020 to 2021, your faithfulness to Jesus and your calling and, 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 and commitment to what God is doing at Transformation Church has been just incredible. I, I am proud in a godly way of the people here at Transformation Church. Now, today marks like one year since this global pandemic swept across the world, flipped us upside down, we went virtual, and 2020 was one of, if not the most effective year that we have ever had at Transformation Church. Desperation produces innovation. We have the Hope Dealers Market. We paid, oh gosh, $4 million of medical debt and so many other things. Hundreds of pe people coming to faith, people joining, the, I mean, just absolutely incredible. So adversity was our university. Desperation produces innovation. And in this testing, God made us stronger. So I got some great news. We are planning to regather. Now, notice the language here. It's, it's, it's not reopened because we have been open. We just hadn't been meeting physically, but Transformation Church has been going. Jesus has been, been, been just powerful amongst the Spirit of God, has been blowing fresh wind and fresh fire upon us. It has been epic. So we are regathering. Listen to this now. Sunday, April 4th. For Easter will be our first Sunday back. Hold on, let me let me hit y'all with it. Ah, let me, hold on, let me get. Oh, uh, give y'all some of that wherever you are. Yes, yes, Easter. We're coming back Sunday, April fourth. For Easter will be our first service back, and we have a graphic with the service times that you will know the times. Now, you will have to register to attend the services, and here's why: is because your safety is important to us. Um, that's how we love our neighbors as we love ourselves, that, that your safety is important, okay? So registration for Easter will begin March 21st. March 21st, our teams have been working incredibly hard. You have an incredible group of ministry leaders, an incredible group of elder pastors, of men and women that love Jesus, that love you, and have done a phenomenal job. And so all the details are gonna be on the website. Uh, our team is working hard to make this the safest possible area. So get ready, Easter Sunday, April 4th. I'm so looking forward to that. All right, so let's dive into week two of our sermon series, Refuse. Um, so, so, so what exactly, teenagers, 
and young adults are, are we refusing? We, we are refusing to allow anything or anyone to determine our lives but Jesus. Let me say it again. We are, refu- we are refusing to allow anyone or anything to determine our lives but Jesus. Now, for those of you new to the faith or exploring Christ, this isn't something that we muster up in ourselves and I'm going to refuse. No, it begins with God's initiation in Jesus. God comes to us. God grabs our heart in Christ. In Christ. This is called grace. Grace is God saying, you can't reach me, but I love you and I'm going to reach you. And so Jesus on the cross, Jesus in his resurrection through the power of the Holy Spirit reaches us and he plants himself inside of us. Theologians call this regeneration. I call it good news. Regeneration means this, that the God of heaven and earth now lives in you. You are alive with the very life of Jesus. The same Jesus that walked out of that tomb is the same Jesus that wants to walk in you. So what happens now? Is, is as we trust him more and more, we give him more access. We, we, we open doors to him that were one, once closed, and he begins to live through us. And so we are refusing to allow anything or anyone to determine our lives except Jesus. In the ancient world, belief or faith was allegiance. So, so this is allegiance to Jesus because his allegiance to be our Savior and our king. He initiates, he empowers. The only thing that we do is say, yes, I trust you. This week, we're going to look at refusing to flaunt your gift. Now, that's some old school language, but I'm going to put a new school twist on it, but follow me, okay? So, Vicki and I recently returned back from our alma mater, Brigham Young University. And so, on the flight back, Man, we were wore out. We spoke 20 times in two days. It was absolutely incredible. So on the way back, that's a long flight, I decided to watch a movie. And so the movie I watched was called The Hidden Life. And The Hidden Life was basically a movie about a gentleman in Austria during the time of Hitler's psychotic Reign. So, so let me give you a little history, and this is really important, and particularly to the Gen Z and the millennials. This is important. Know your history. If we don't know history, we are doomed to repeat it, okay? So it's important for us to know our history. Let me give you a little background. Uh, the Nazi party grew into a mass movement and ruled Germany through totalitarian means from 1933 to 1945 under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. Founded in 1919 as the German Workers' Party, Hitler and his group promoted German pride, like Germany first, and anti-Semitism. What what is anti-Semitism? Anti means against, Semitism means basically against Jewish people. And so what Hitler did is coming out of World War I, Germany was in incredible economic ruin. And what he did is he wrote a book while in prison called Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. It was called the Nazi Bible. By the way, it made him a millionaire as well. So from 1933 to 1945, free copies were given to every newly married German couple. He was an incredible speaker one of the greatest speakers of all time. His fiery speeches swelled the ranks of the Nazi party, especially amongst the young, and listen to this, the economically disadvantaged. So what he said to the young and particularly to the poor, hey, it's the Jewish people still in your jobs. Germany first. Like, like we've got to get these people out. And, and then in Mein Kampf, it was like us Aryans are the master race. And so we're going to get rid of the Jews first, and then we're going to get rid of everybody else that we deem inferior to us. Uh, matter of fact, I think I have a picture of the Holocaust, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if so, I want to show that. Maybe you have that. Um, if not, you can Google it. Um, when I went to Jerusalem um, a couple of years ago, one of the aspects of the tour was to go to the Holocaust Museum. And it was, there's like really no words for it. 
To think that uh, six million Jewish people, simply because of their race, were exterminated in the most heinous and cruel ways imaginable. On the tour, none of us could really talk. You know, in my, in my mind, I'm like, well, how does the world allow this to happen? How did other Germans go along with this? So, so never forget this. Ideas have consequences. And typically, people who are bitter, people who are financially struggling, people who already have an ideology of ethnic superiority and racism in them will fall prey to extremist groups. But in the midst of this, there was a gentleman who is the center focus of the story. His name is Franz Jägerstetter. And he was a simple farmer. And this is what he said. Right from the very beginning, Jägerstetter refused to cooperate with or support the Nazis who took power in Austria in 1938 as he viewed Christianity and Nazism as being completely irreconcilable. Irreconcilable is a big, big word, but, but teenagers and preteens and Gen Z, um, this man, Franz, be, because of his faith in Jesus, he said, no, my country is what it's doing is wrong. Racism is wrong. That, that, that is antithetical to the good news of Jesus, which says, love my neighbor as I love myself. And so he actually refused to get into Hitler's army. So what happened to him? He got arrested, he got tortured, he got imprisoned, and ultimately he got his head chopped off at a guillotine. You're like, pastor, why are you bringing this up? Here's why. I did a little research, and I want you to fill this in. The beauty of a hidden life. The beauty of a hidden life. George Eliot, which, by the way, is a female, but back in her day when she wrote, women got painted a certain way, so she had to use a guy's name so her work would be taken seriously. But I'm going to read this slowly and let this penetrate your heart. The beauty of a hidden life. For the growing good of the world, listen, the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unheroic acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived a faithfully, who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisit tombs. Man, when I read that, that, that blew me away. So, so let me put some Derwin Gray on it. The world could be a lot worse if it were not for people that God uses in extraordinary ways that'll never make the news, that'll never make Instagram, that'll never make Facebook, that'll never make Twitter because they are so concerned with being faithful to God. And there is so much pressure in today's world. You have to tweet all the time. You have to Instagram all the time. Listen, I love little children as much as all the little, Pastor Derwin loved the little children's, y'all. But I seen your baby yesterday, and it looked the same. And the other day, your baby looked the same. And the other day, your baby looked the same. Now, show your baby. I'm not saying don't. My question is, what's the heart underneath it? What's the, what's, the, what's the heart behind our insensent desire to want to be known, to want to be recognized? Now, listen, are those things good? Yes, but like a rose, you smell them and you give them back to God. Check this out. Instead of seeking attention, be attentive to God. Be attentive to God to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Be, be attentive to Jesus. Instead of seeking attention, be attentive. So now, let's go back into our story of Joseph. Now, now where we are in the story, right? So, so we have the, the prequel in eternity, Father, Son, and Spirit, an ultimate love feast. And, and then we have creation where, where God creates Adam and Eve to be his image bearers and to multiply what's happening in heaven on earth because they're tied to him. 
And then we have the rebellion or the fall when Adam and Eve say, no, God, we want to build our kingdom. We want to be recognized. We want wisdom. We want glory. We don't want you. And so when they do that, hell is unleashed on earth. Every human being is broken. But then we have stage four of the story, the promise, where God makes a promise with a man named Abram, and he changes his name to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, through you, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to have so many babies like the stars in the heavens, and all the families of the earth, all the ethnic groups of the earth are going to be blessed through you. Ultimately, that blessing is Jesus. But before we get to that part of the story, let's move to the next stage, Israel. God creates a nation called Israel. Israel means to struggle with God. And, and, and God gives Israel a beautiful code to live life, the Torah, which ultimately is love God, love your neighbors, you love yourself. He gives them a unique way to eat, a unique way to be, to be separate from the world, to show the world what life with God looks like. But ultimately, Israel fails like Adam and Eve. So what does God do? Here comes the next act of the scene. Jesus comes, and Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Everything that Adam and Eve were to be, everything that Israel was to be, everything that you and I was to be, Jesus is. That's called grace. And Jesus lives a sinless life. Jesus dies on a cross for you, dies on a cross for me. Jesus raises again to create this new family that God promised Abraham. Think about this, whether if you're black, white, Asian, Latino, whatever you are, God presents you to his dad and goes, dad, you are faithful to keep your promises because I am faithful to you. And all these different multicolored people belong to you. Not only did I forgive their sins, but I made a family with different colored skins. This family, the next phase is called the church, and the church exists to do what? Love God, love your neighbors, you love yourself, and go on mission wherever you are to proclaim the beauty and the love of Christ. And that's called being a disciple, a student of Jesus. We're growing in his ways. We're growing in his patience. We're growing in his forgiveness. We're growing in his truth. We're growing in his mercy, and then one day the king is going to come back, and when he does, he's going to make a new heavens. He's going to make a new earth, and there's going to be lots of worship. There's going to be lots of praise, but we're also going to rule and reign with God, and there are going to be things that are going to blow our everlasting mind. The apostle Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has in store, and the story keeps on going and going and going of utter joy and beauty and greatness and life beyond imagination. So let's go back now. We're at the story of Joseph who plays a pivotal part in formation of the nation of Israel, which brought about Jesus, which brought about you and I. And there's some things that we can learn from Joseph. And what we're going to find out is it's not to be like Joseph, but to worship the God that Joseph worshiped. Genesis chapter 37, 5 through 11. Then Joseph had a dream. One of the ways God gifted Joseph was the ability to dream. And ultimately, these dreams are going to come true, and we're going to find that out in Genesis like 44, okay? But let me pause here. Does God work through dreams to today? Yes, but dreams are not on the same level as scripture. If you have a dream, cool. But ultimately, scripture is sufficient for life and godliness. And can God use dreams? Yes, but that is a third or fourth order of how God communicates us. In Joseph's time, there was no scripture. So this is scripture being written. Then Joseph had a dream. And watch what he does. And remember from last week, his brothers did not like him because Joseph was his daddy's favorite. It was great toxic family dysfunction. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. So they didn't like Jojo to begin with, and they hate him even more. Why? Listen to this dream. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. There were binding shills of grain in the field. Suddenly, my Sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Are you really going to reign over us, his brothers asked him? Are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he said. Verse 9, then he had another dream, and he told his brothers, look, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. 
He told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you've had, he said? Am I and your mother and brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this matter in mind. So let's pause here. Ultimately, this is going to be true. And if you're reading the story of Joseph in Genesis 37 through 50, you know what's going to take place. If you don't, uh, I don't want to give you any spoiler alerts, but, but here's the thing, though. Joseph was 17 years old. He was his dad's favorite. He knew his brothers didn't like him. So here's the question. Why even say anything? Like, like, like we have two ears, two eyes, and one mouth for a reason. Just because God puts something in your heart doesn't mean you necessarily have to say it or have to flaunt it. And he, he, he's 17 years old, and, and I'm sure he's excited, and, and he probably didn't take time to really concern himself with what his brothers felt and what his brothers thought. And so it's very important for us to have a sense of, of awareness, and one of the things, the older you get, the more aware we should get. However, that's not necessarily true, and so we need the Holy Spirit's power. We need the power of Christ to help us to be aware. So we got Joseph like, yo, bros, check this out. One day, all y'all kneeling before me. What you think about this dream, huh? Not only that, look at my brand new coat. Look at that, my Gucci, it's about that time. Uh, uh, y'all know nothing about the Beastie Boys. Oh, man. All right. So how do you and I refuse to flaunt our gift? And part of what I'm going to do is many of you, I don't have to tell you that you have a gift. Like, you already know. But for some of you, like, well, not me. Will God really use me? Yeah, he will. And, 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 and I want to show you from the scripture, right? But, but how do we refuse to flaunt our gift? Number one, we walk humbly. We walk humbly because here's why. You and your gifting belong to God. My gifting belong to God. Matter of fact, let's even kick it, kick it up from a horizontal perspective. The air we breathe belongs to God. The sun we see belongs to God. The cool breeze we feel belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Like, what is there really to boast about? Even the will and desire to do things, God gave it to you, now you gotta use it, right? So, so learning to walk Humbly. Look what Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says. The context is the Apostle Paul is talking to church leaders in Ephesus, and, and, and he's getting ready to leave. They're not going to see him again. And look what he says here. There's a couple things. He says, be on guard for yourselves, okay? So be on guard. In the Greek language, be on guard means be on guard. We got to be intentional about walking with God, intentional about receiving his love and his mercy, intentional about holding his nail-pierced hands. Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers. So, so for elders and pastors in the New Testament, the word overseer, the word shepherd, the word bishop reflect those who are called to care for the flock. And so there is immense responsibility that your elders share, your overseers share. We typically don't use the word overseer because it's not really used a whole bunch, but overseer, bishop, elder, pastor are synonymous. So pray for us. Uh, to shepherd the church of God. Now watch this. Which he purchased with his own blood. So let's shift it from elder pastor to all of us as God's people. You and I were purchased by the blood of Jesus. You and I were purchased by the blood of Jesus. He, he, here's a couple things. Rooted in the ancient world, the blood meant atonement or, 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 or wiping over. So, so because we're disconnected from God because of the original rebellion and we're born separated from God, we're born running from God, we are born estranged from God, but God wants to make us born again. And how does he do it? Through the means of blood, that, that the blood of Jesus, that on the cross, Jesus is the place where sin goes 
to die, that on the cross, when that precious blood flows, when the blood is drained from Emmanuel's veins, God purchases us. Not only does he forgive us, praise God, not only does he remove our sin, our guilt, our shame, his blood says, you are mine. He didn't buy you with silver. He didn't buy you with gold. He didn't buy you with Bitcoin, he bought you with the most expensive reality there is, the precious blood of the lamb. So what does that mean? It means you're forgiven, it means you're new, it means you're righteous, it means you're loved, and it means that in him you are valuable. Our worth and our value comes from what was paid for us. And God gave what was most expensive, the eternal son to give us eternal forgiveness. We live in the eternal bloodbath of Jesus. All belongs to him. And here's what's beautiful, when, when he bleeds on us, we, we get gifts. As a matter of fact, can I have my gift please? I, I think somebody, somebody's got a gift for me. Anybody, oh, thank you. And my birthday's April 9th, by the way. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. So, so I'm gonna be 50 years old, y'all, on April 9th. Ain't that a trip? 50, man. 50 years old. I mean, I got kids like 24 and 20. I am a grown man, people. That's crazy, 50. So, so, so what if on my 50th birthday, people just got me like a bunch of gifts, right? And, and these gifts were just incredible things, and, and they were awesome, and, and they were beautiful and things that could enhance my life. And I looked at those gifts, and I refused to unopen them. I'm like, no, nope, I don't want what's in there. I'm good. That's what happens to many of us as we come to faith. We go, Jesus, thank you. I'm forgiven, but I don't want to unopen the spiritual gifts that the Spirit of God give me. And here's the thing, y'all. These spiritual gifts are not for you. They're actually for people that God wants to heal and touch and transform through you. And when you do not allow the giver of the gift to express his giftedness through you, it's like trying to build a dam with holes in it and water gets through. Don't neglect the spiritual gift that you have. And you go, Pastor, how do I know I have a spiritual gift? I'm getting there. Listen to this. Romans chapter 12, verses three through eight. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. So there's some humility again. Um, it's important for us not to be walking around filling ourselves. Instead, think sensibly. Why think sensibly? As God has distributed a measure of faith to each one of us. Notice, it's God's initiation. God is the one who provides. Verse 4. Now, as we have many parts in one body, for those of you new to the faith and teenagers, the church, not just Transformation Church, but all churches around the world to call upon the name of Jesus and his true gospel of salvation by grace through faith, we are the church, but we're a local church called Transformation Church. So in our context, those of us who call TC home, God has given you a gift for this local body and also for the world. Now watch this. And all the parts do not have the same function. In the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So my success is your success. Your success is my success. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. Now, here's what's, what's important, and I'm not trying to make fun of anybody, but I, I, I want to use an illustration. Often when I go to the gym, like I see these dudes and their upper bodies are just like, I mean, it's like they can lift up. Pluto and, and Mars and Neptune, then their legs be really little, little, little. It's like you can do legs too, right? So you, so you want to be developed. Like you want to have some glutes. You want to have some thighs, some calves. You know what I'm saying? You want to make it holistic. Well, oftentimes that's the way the church is, is we'll have these big parts and these smart. We, we need to develop holistically all of us. Watch this. Verse six, according to the grace given to us, 
We have different gifts. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, not only did you get forgiven, not only did you get a bloodbath, not only were you made a new creation, not only did Christ come to live in you, not only did the Father come to live in you, but the Holy Spirit came to live in you to give you a gift for the building up of the body of Christ and to display God's glory out in school, out in world, out wherever you are. You have a gift. If prophecy, use it according to the portion of one's faith. What is prophecy? Prophecy means this, is that you speak God's word to people primarily through scripture. Um, has there ever been a time where you were like, hey, um, man, I, I really sense God is telling me to share this with you, and then you share scripture with them. That's using the gift of prophecy. It's something you wasn't even thinking about, and it takes place. It's not weird. It's not spooky. Unfortunately, around the time of election, we had all these people making, quote, unquote, prophecies about what's going to happen in the future uh, no, this here, as scripture is written, prophecy is for mutual encouragement, it's for constellation, it's to build up the body of Christ, and it's primarily communicating scriptural truths to people in a particular situation that you had no idea, and it's not weird, it's not spooky, okay? Use it according to the portion of one's faith. Verse seven, if service, use it in service, if teaching, in teaching. In our TC groups, many of you exercise the gift of teaching in your jobs, wherever you are, at your school. You may not even know it. You just like to share things with pe people. If exhortation, in exhortation. In giving, with generosity, with leading, with diligence, showing mercy and cheerfulness. Notice this, mercy and cheerfulness and leading are gifts and so is giving. So now, how do we unwrap these gifts. How do we do that? I'm glad you asked. Number two, develop your character more than your gift. Develop your character more than your gift. This, will, this is what will take place, is that, is that as you're allowing Jesus to transform you, as you're allowing Jesus to meet you, as you're allowing Jesus through the Holy Spirit's power to, to, to have access to our fears, to our doubts, to our insecurities, to our pride, to our sins. As we give him more access, what will take place is we will be overwhelmed with who he is and what he's accomplished. That's called worship. That's called praise. And as we're praising him, as we're worshiping him, it's like inhale grace, exhale love. And your spiritual gifts are a facet of how God loves the world. And it happens in the everydayness of life. As you're going and as you're moving, at work, at school, as long as we are intentional and our character is developed as we marinate in the person and the beauty of Christ Jesus. This is why it's important that you go through the transformation track we, we, we wanna give you the foundational basis of understanding how you grow in your faith. L listen, your growth is important. Your transformation is important. There is a powerful hidden life in you that can make a difference in other people's lives. Like, like, like don't sell your soul. Don't do it. His grace is better because there are some of you right now, you, you, are, you, are, you are like right there ready for a breakthrough. Now, when I say breakthrough, I'm not talking about more money. I'm talking about seeing more of Jesus. I'm talking about experiencing more of God's power, more of God's grace, more of God's mercy. I'm talking about loving like you've never loved before, forgiving like you've never forgi forgiven before. I'm talking about being healed from trauma, and I'm talking about going into the world to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's the breakthrough. It is breaking down the gates of hell and rescuing people from dark power. That's the breakthrough. That's the riches of Christ. That's the goodness of Christ. That's your destiny. That's who you're called to be. That's the church. Check this out. Our character is forged in a furnace 
of life. Who you're becoming is more important than what you do. Who you're becoming is more important than what you do. And the Spirit is saying, I want you to become like Christ. His attitudes, his ways. And what's beautiful is what the Holy Spirit commands, he gives the grace to fulfill it. You ever play the game Tag Your It? I love that game because back in the day, you know, we didn't have like video games and smartphones. Like we literally had to go outside to play. Can you imagine this? Back in the day, our, our, my grandma would say, listen, go outside and play. Do not come back until it's dark. And then all throughout the day, we were eating at people's houses and we were playing. I mean, that's all we did was played. And I mean, we were in shape. We we're running around. It was glorious, right? But tag your it was fun. And in tag your it, you're always running after somebody, right? Maybe that's how I got fast, just running after the older kids. Well, when it comes to your gift and your character, you always want your gift running behind your character. You always want your character to be ahead of your gift because here's why. If your gift is ahead of your character, you are doomed for a fall. And here's the thing, why are you doomed for a fall? Because you will begin to think too highly of yourself. That's called pride. That's what made Satan fall. That's what made Adam and Eve fall. Every sin that we commit is because of pride. Sin means to miss the mark. The Durham Great translation of sin means this, God, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. It's rebellion. And what happens is, is we take God's gift and God's abilities and God's talents and we begin to think it's our ability and our talent and we let down our guard and we are devoured and so your character is always trying to chase your gift. And here's the thing, particularly if you're in ministry and you're gifted, people are gonna tell you how great you are. No, 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 God is great. People are gonna tell you how gifted you are. No, no, no. God is the gift giver. It is God all day, every day from eternity past to right now to eternity future. And so when a person's gifting is ahead of their character and they blow up, not only do they get hurt, but the people they are in relationship with. So Philippians 2, 3, listen to this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit but in humility consider others as more important than themselves. Number three, does your gift exalt you or make a positive difference in the lives of others? Now here's the deal, you can make a positive difference in the lives of others without exalting yourself. When someone says, hey, great job, you go, thank you very much, man, God is gracious. And it's not a lie, it's, it's true. Look what Philippians 2, 4 says, everyone should not look, not to his own interests, but rather to the interest of others. How does your gifting, whether natural or spiritual gifts in the office, in your relationships, at school, um, because ideally, when God gives you this gift, it's to transform lives through your gift. Wouldn't it be sad to have an incredible gift but never enjoy the one who gave you the gift? Check this out. Um, George Eliot, she, she wrote this, and I want you to marinate on this as the worship team comes out, is she writes this, what do we live for if it is not to make life less difficult for each other. Man, how radically different is that than our culture? Because our culture is pretty much, get yours, do it your way. Be successful, succeed, more, 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 get, get, get. But think about this, what do we live for if it is not to make life less difficult for each other. And so ultimately what you're gonna see is the gift that God gives Joseph 
is gonna make life better for others? Oh man, but there's a fiery furnace that he goes through. And often in the fiery furnace that we go through, God not only refines us, but he refines our gifts and he keeps us humble in the midst of it. As Pastor KJ and the worship team sing, allow the words to minister to your heart, then I'm gonna come back out because I believe that there are many of you who are tired of seeking recognition, tired of seeking to be known, and you're ready to be known by Jesus. For many of you, this is gonna be the day that you give your life and allegiance to him.
yes you did On a hill you created The light of the world Abandoned in darkness to die And that's your word And as you speak And not as you speak yeah. A heart to feel You fell Just disappeared When you lost your life So I could find it here If you left the grave behind you So I can see What a gracious king that we have. He never leaves the one behind. He leaves the 99 to, to go after the one. There are many of you who are that one and you feel like I've done too much, God can't love me, I'm too damaged, God can't love me. I'm too far gone, he can't love me. All those are lies from the pit of the hell Be because the reality is this, there's no too far you can go to outrun the blood of Jesus. There's not too much damage that you've done to outdo the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is powerful enough yeah. to turn the worst to the best. The blood of Jesus can forgive every sin. The blood of yeah. Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Today is your day. You, you are that one. Today is the day that, that King Jesus is looking you in the eyes and you're giving him every excuse and, and everything you've done wrong and how you blew this and what happened to you and you're giving him all these excuses and he's looking at you with tears in his eyes and he says, I already know and I came for you anyway. Before you called my name, I was on my way. Before you were born, I was on the cross. Before you had a need, I was given grace. Before you ever knew it, I was on my way. He's a on my way savior. That's who he is. He's coming for you. He wants you. He is calling your name. Brian, he's calling you. Stephanie, he's calling you. Sean, he's calling you. Tim, he's calling you. Henry, he's calling you. He is calling your name. Today is the day that you walk into the kingdom. 
not with your head bowed down, but with your head held high. Because as you approach the Father, you are coming with His Son, and He says, Dad, they are with me. Dad, they are clean. Dad, they are forgiven. Dad, they are righteous. Dad, they are yours. He purchased you with His blood. Today is your day. Right where you are, will you, will you pray with me? Say this to him, right where you are. Today, Lord Jesus, I bow my knee, I stop running, I stop hiding, because when I ran, you were there. When I hid, you was already there. So today I bow my knee and I say yes to you. I say yes to the blood that flowed on that cross. I say yes to that empty tomb. I believe with all of my heart that on that cross you took my place to forever forgive my sin and I believe that on the third day when you rose again, I came to new life in you, that I'm a part of your family, I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed, I'm yours. Thank you, Lord Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. Uh, right where you are before I read the soul tattoo, if you're watching by TV, I want you to open up your smartphone, and there's gonna be a QR code that comes, and just point your smartphone with the camera app open at the QR code, and it's gonna take you to our connection card. For those of you not watching by TV by another device, you'll be able to get on our connection card as well. And on the connection card, if you prayed with me to receive Jesus, we want to know this, and here's why. Number one, we want to celebrate with you. The Bible says that when someone comes to faith, when a sinner repents and they enter God's kingdom, that the angels are rejoicing, and we wanna rejoice with you. Number two, uh, we wanna connect with you and begin to help you grow and mature in this newfound life that you have in Jesus. There's no such thing as a solo follower of Christ. Uh, we are a family. So if you would take time to do that, that matters to us, it matters to you. Whether if you're a preteen, a teenager, whether if you're in your 70s, whoever you are, um, let us know that. Now, our, our soul tattoo, this is gonna require some intentionality. What are ways you and I have been seeking attention for the wrong reasons? Now, rem re remember this, there's no condemnation in Christ. There's conviction, but not condemnation. He already knows, just bring it to him because what's not revealed remains unhealed. And here's our action step. Uh, receive your affirmation from God and process in community, meaning talk to other followers of Christ about this. Also download our Refuse Guide and walk through the discussion questions in your TC group. The Refuse Guide is simply astonishing. Hey, um, love y'all, and uh, I'm looking forward to us regathering on April 4th.